name's Matt, and I'm the family pastor here at Fusion Christian Church, and I'm so grateful that you're with us. And um, ultimately, I'm grateful for the church family that we have. Most of you know, some of you don't, uh, my dad passed away about 15 days ago. And this is my first time up here preaching since, since that happened. And I'm incredibly grateful for the family that we have that reached out um, to care for us through that time, right? And uh, it's hard singing Good, Good Father, right? And you don't think of your earthly dad. Um, and so, you know, kind of welling up a little bit singing Good, Good Fathers. I think about my dad. Uh, and now, you know, he was struggling with ALS and now he's a new body and no more pain, no more tears, no more suffering. He's, he's with the Lord in heaven. So um, grateful for the church family, right? And I think about that song, Good, Good Father, right? We sing it because it's all about a relationship, right? Father, son, father, daughter. It's a relationship that we have. And God has called us to be in a relationship. That's what our faith is all about. It's not, it's not about a set of things that we do. It's about having a relationship with the God of all creation, the God of the universe. And so that's why we're going through this series, God Is. And we're looking at the different names of God and how he's created us and who he is and how he's revealed himself to us so that we can deepen our relationship. 12 years ago, I got married on uh, 7 7 Oh, seven, the easiest anniversary to remember. If I forget that, I'm in trouble. It's three sevens, July 7th, 2007. First service, I did say September, not July. So I, I didn't do that again. I almost was on the tip of my tongue to say September, but it's seven, seven, not September. Okay, July 7th, 07. And, uh, you know, I kind of robbed the cradle a little bit. My wife was 19 when we got married. I was 24, right? A little crazy. But she was 18 when we started dating. And I remember the first time I held her hand was like fireworks going off in my heart. Okay, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like the first time of the, the first love of your life, you hold hands it's like, oh my gosh. And then a couple of weeks later, you're just like, oh, I'm holding hands. <laughs> right? Uh, but then like the first time you kiss, it's like, oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing ever. And it's like, you haven't brushed your teeth. I don't want to kiss you today. <laughs> right? But these feelings of being in love, right? They fade over time. But I'm more in love with my wife now than when I had all those firework feelings holding her hands and kissing her. Why? Because I know who she is. I know her character. I know her heart. I know the, the, the woman that she is for me and vice versa. She knows who I am. She knows my strengths. She knows my weaknesses. She knows the personality that I have. She knows my loyalty and my honor for her and all the things that we have, right? And so those things have built over the last 12 years and our relationship has grown. So now we are actually deeper in love now than we were when we had all of those firework feelings. Those fade, but our love and trust and honor for one another grows. The same is true in our relationship with God. The more we get to know his character, what he is like, the things that we can lean on, the easier it is for us to trust him and to surrender to him and to love him because we know God so much deeper. That relationship grows. And that's why we're doing this series, God Is, so we can learn about the character of who God is. Now, I want to open up with a verse. It's not in your notes, but it's on the board. It's Ephesians chapter 1. And this is Apostle Paul's prayer for the church in, in Ephesians. It's verse 15 through 23. You can follow along on the board. It says this. It says, for this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So he's writing to the church saying, hey, you're on my heart all the time. I'm praying for you. And this is what he's praying for you. And this is my prayer for you this morning. In fact, this is what I pray every single Sunday morning for anyone who's going to church. They're opening the word of God and they're about to read. This is what I want us to understand. This is, this is the purpose of why we listen to the teachings. It says this. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. That God would reveal himself to us. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You know what that hope is? That hope is where my dad is now resting. As Apostle Paul said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him, that we would know that hope to which he has called you. 
the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power is the same mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available in our lives. Did you know that? That's what scripture is talking about right here. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under Jesus's feet and appointed him, Jesus, to be the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That's my prayer this morning, is that you, that God would open the eyes of your heart and you'd, you'd know God a little bit more today. You'd know him a little bit more about his character and about, uh, about what he has done for us and what he is currently doing for us so that it can grow our faith and that we can go out there and live our lives knowing the God that we serve. Now, in order to do that, we're gonna go back to the Old Testament we're going to go back to Genesis 22. You see, throughout the Old Testament, God revealed himself through different names. And the name we're going to look at today is Jehovah Jireh. And you might be like, what does that mean? What does Jehovah Jireh mean? Well, we're going to get into that. Okay, Jehovah Jireh is the name that we're looking at. And it's going to be in Genesis 22. Now, a lot of people struggle with this passage. How could God ask um, Abraham to do this? Okay, we're not going to get into that theological question. If you have questions about that, come talk to me afterwards. But there's a purpose and a reason behind it, okay? Genesis 22. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him in the God voice, right? Abraham. I, that's what I think it sounds like. I don't know. Here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. And sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will show you. I want to pause. God told Abraham at 90 he was going to have a kid. And then he had to wait 12 years before he had him, his only son, Isaac. And then God said, sacrifice him. Think of the weight on that. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac, 102 years old, when he had him, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. We had 17 pine trees on our house that we cut down, and I get the ax out, and I try splitting it. I split, you know, like four or five, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm done splitting wood. This dude is in his hundreds just splitting wood like a man, okay? I just want to point that out. We kind of go past that sometimes. When he cut enough wood, he set out for the place that God had told him about, and on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, son. Uh, where's the offering? <laughs> Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand, took the knife, to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear the Lord because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. So he went over, he took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place Jehovah-Jireh. The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. I want to pause. When we started reading this, it said, go to Moriah. Do you guys know where Mount Moriah is? Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. 
Second Chronicles 3, 1 says that Solomon put the foundation and built the temple of God on Mount Moriah. Later, when Jesus would be betrayed and beaten and scourged for our sin, it would be at Mount Moriah. You see, God had a plan for this place. God had a plan in his providence over the history of time, and we can understand that God has a plan, and his providence is in our life. His sovereignty is over our life, even now as we're here at church this morning. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. Angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations of earth will be blessed. That's Jesus because you have obeyed. The thing we need to understand about God's character is that he is Jehovah Jireh, that God will provide. That's our first fill this morning is that God is our provider. That's who he is. And there's three things that I want to look at at how God provides to our family, uh, us as believers, the church family, three things. The first thing I want to point out is that God provides our salvation. That story we just read in the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac and the ram being the substitute for his sacrifice, that is a clear foreshadowing and picture of the gospel for us. Because the gospel says that we deserve punishment for our sin. And Christ took our place. Let's look through the book of Romans and it gives us these these, um, theologically important things to understand about our salvation. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're in here and you think you're perfect, I'm going to bust your bubble. No one is perfect. You might think you are, but you're not. I used to think I was, and I found out I wasn't. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the standard that God sets. But here's the beautiful news. But all are justified freely. Whenever you see that justified you could think of this. Justified is just as if I'd never sinned when God has justified us. We're justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. The theological term for the the thing in Abraham is substitutionary atonement. The ram took the place, substituted itself for Isaac on the altar. That's what Jesus did for us. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, tells us, took our place on the cross. And this is to be received by faith. I'm going to stop there and not read on. Romans 5 tells us this. I love how it says this right here. It says, you see, at just the right time, at just the right time, Abraham looked up and at just the right time, there was a ram caught in the bushes. Same thing's true for us. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. The night I gave my life to Jesus was just the right time. August 20th, 2002. 17 years ago. 17 years and five days. Was just the right time in my life. When you're ready to give your life to Jesus, it's just the right time. You see, my dad had almost passed away from a heart attack. And I got to tell him this before he passed away. He'd almost passed away from a heart attack. And that shook my world. I started drinking a fifth of whiskey a night. I started smoking weed nine times a day. I started living like I had nothing to live for. And the moment I gave my life to Jesus, he removed that. He took away the pain. He took away the addiction. He took away the need. And it was just the right time. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But get this, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us. He demonstrated it. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23 says this. The wages of sin is death. The cost of our sin is eternal death. 
away from God. That's eternity away from his presence. Pastor Zach talked about that a couple weeks ago. And I love the way the ESV says it. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It wasn't free for Jesus. It cost him his life. But it's free for us. Available by grace. You see, when we say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, the Lord has provided. He provided the great sacrifice that would ever need to be given. No no other sacrifices are needed. His blood covers it all. Our sin, our past sin, our current sin, and our future sin has all been covered and washed by the blood of the Lamb who paid his life for ours. He substituted his life and atoned our sins on our behalf. That's the Lord will provide. That's Jehovah Jireh. He has provided our salvation. If you hear nothing else this morning, this is what you need to hear because eternity is in the balance. See, God says you have two options. Since we all sin and we all fall short, we can pay for our sin or we can allow Jesus to pay for our sin. And the choice is ours. I'm going to place my sin on the shoulders of Jesus who died for me and who died for you. God provides our salvation. The second thing God provides, among many in Scripture, I'm just going over three. God provides our strength. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 says this, His divine power, this is God's power working in our lives, right? And we, in Ephesians, right, the same power, the same mighty power that raised God, that raised Jesus from the dead is available in our lives. That's the power it's talking about. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. God's given us everything we need. He's given everything you need to overcome your depression. He's given you everything you need to overcome your addiction. He's given you everything you need to overcome the hurt in your life. His divine power has made that available in your life. He's given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I like the way Psalm says it this way. Psalms 18, verses 31 through 36, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word Scripture, it's flawless. And he shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and he keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. That's odd. I got size 13s. I don't have deer feet. But what's he talking about? Causes me to stand on the heights. You ever see how deer and mountain sheep can just stand on like these crazy cliffs securely? It's because how God designed their feet. He's saying even on the cliffs of life, you will stand secure. He trains my hands for battle and my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield and your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great, and you provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. You see, God gives us our strength. He's given us everything we need for a godly life. This is not in your notes, not on the board. Psalm 66, 16. Uh, It's a verse that means a ton to me. It says, come and listen. Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. And in that verse, we learn that that personal stories of how God has worked in your life, they hold a lot of power. And I want to share some personal stories of how God has shown up in my life as Jehovah Jireh, as the Lord will provide. And I want to share these stories with you to encourage your faith. So as I shared, we got married on 7707, 12 years ago. And uh, right after we got married, we really sensed that God was calling us to a new ministry, okay? Um, my, my father-in-law was a pastor, so I married the senior pastor's daughter at the church I was interning at, okay? So probably wasn't wise to stay there underneath dad for much longer. And so God uh, had provided a few opportunities for us to go into the ministry. I had started interning at this church, and I was a director at the church I was at. And then God opened the door, and I had three job offers to be, go to full-time ministry, okay? This is at 24, 24 years old, 24, 25, something like 25 years old. Yeah, just turned 25. And I got an offer to be a high school pastor in Los Altos up in the Bay Area. Super nice weather, nice area, 
you know, I'm a Bay Area guy. So I was like, this is great. The highest pay, work with high school students. Okay, that was number one on my box. Check it. Then I got an offer up in Rockland in the Sacramento area. $10,000 less a year, but worth working high school and junior high. Okay. Then the third offer was in Modesto, California. Los Altos, Rockland, Modesto. If you're from Modesto, forgive me. I ended up living there for two years. So um, Modesto to work with junior high students and $10,000 less than the middle job. Okay. So 20, 20K less working with junior high students. And I said, God, I will never work with junior high students and I will not live in Modesto. And we ended up taking the job in Modesto working with junior high students. I learned that day, never say never to God, right? Like Justin Bieber. Um, for those of you that don't know Justin Bieber, he sang the song, Never Say Never. I won't do my impression. It'll not be good. So, uh, yeah, sing it. No, I don't have the vocals of Josh, our worship leader. So um, we go to Modesto and uh, working with junior high students and the pastors hold this meeting and they talk about health insurance. And this is the first, my first full-time job. I got health insurance. Okay, this is great. And they talk about how they're changing to this health savings account where you can save your pre-tax dollars in case you have medical needs. And I'm 25 year old, about 65 pounds lighter than I am now, pretty fit, you know, thinking good about my life, you know, never really had any medical issues. You know, I was a water pole player. I thought a lot of myself, right? When I said I thought I was perfect earlier, I actually did think I was perfect earlier in life. And so I raised my hand. I go, so if I, if I never get sick, if I don't have any medical issues, like, do I have to take money out of my paycheck for health issues? And they're like, no, no, no. If you're healthy, like, you don't need to take anything out. Five days later, I was hospitalized and diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That's the kind you normally get when you're like five, six, seven, eight, you know, kind of early on. How old were you when you got it? 14, right? I was 25 when I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Five days after, I'm like, I never get sick. I don't need to save any money. Here's one of the most expensive diseases you can have. Insulin and all that fun stuff. So I was like, man, what is going on? Little did I know, I had been at the church for a month. On my staff that I inherited... My junior high staff, the, the staff that was before me, I inherited. I had a wife of a type 1 diabetic. I had a mother of a type 1 diabetic. And I had a sister of a type 1 diabetic. Already on my junior high staff, in place, that I inherited, that were in my circle of support at the new church I was at. I look back at them and go, God, you, you knew all along. And in my lack of faith, I was like, God, why is this happening to me? Why in my strength am I getting this disease? And he had provided the perfect support system that both my wife and I needed to live with this new disease. That's going to be with me for the rest of my life. I wear a medical device. I got medical devices plugged into my, I got one on this side. I got one on this side. I can't go anywhere without it. It's a, it's a lifestyle change. God provided the strength that I needed. He provided the people that I needed. He provided the exact strength that I needed at that point in my life. And what I want to encourage you with right now, no matter what storm you're going through, whatever valley you feel like you're walking through, we need to understand that God will provide the strength to get us through it. He can provide us the strength and the support through it. That's why God created the church. I shared earlier with my dad's passing, this has been a storm that my wife had been in. But this church came through for my family. That's what small groups are for. Our small group came through for us and supported us and was a strength. God used them as a strength. He provided it in our lives. I love how the Apostle Paul says it in Colossians 1.29. He says, To this end I strenuously contend. Other translation says, To this end I labor, I work, I struggle with all of the energy that Christ so powerfully works in us. See, God strengthens us. Then Philippians 4.13, I think every, every person who's ever been an athlete, I think, has had this, this verse on, you know, written on their shoe, like Steph Curry has 4.13 on his shoes. And, and you know, I had it on my Speedos because I was a water polo player. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. And, you know, us athletes, we're kind of meatheads sometimes, right? And I'm, I'm thinking when I'm on the bench press, I'm like, I got 315 pounds in here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? 
That's not what it's talking about. <laughs> That's not the strength that it's really talking about there. And I think sometimes we use those out of context, right? God, give me the strength to curl this hundred pounds. No. The context is talking about that no matter what we're going through in life, Christ will provide the strength for us to get through it. The strength to handle any situation. No matter how tough, we can lean on Christ to strengthen us, to provide that. God, our provider, Jehovah Jireh, will provide the strength when we're going through those hard times. And you don't have to do it alone. God provides our salvation. God provides our strength. And lastly, God will provide our needs. God provides our needs. I want to be very clear on this when I talk about God's provision um, and we're talking about um, earthly stuff, right? He provides our needs, not our greeds. Can I make that clear? God provides our needs, not our greeds. Sometimes God comes through and provides way more than what we need. But at the base factor, God provides our needs. Listen to how Jesus said it in Matthew 6. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Does anyone in here struggle with worry, anxiety? I know I do sometimes. Jesus saying, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, or they don't store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying, add a single hour to your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For pagans, think about these things. Unbelievers worry about these. They run after these things. And your heavenly father, he knows what you need. He knows your needs. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This is the call for us. We should seek God first. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Our needs will be met. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Early on in my ministry, um, I was challenged to memorize verses, right? Memorize, memorize, memorize. That was the, the pastor I had, memorize verses. And I memorized this next verse to heart, and it really uh, came through for me in my life. It's, it's Philippians 4.19. It says, God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. My father-in-law was here for service. He's, like I said, he was a pastor for 40, he just retired, 40-something years. And uh, I was at a restaurant waiting tables. I'd moved home from college, waiting tables so I can go to seminary. And I got this guy, and he tries to share Jesus with me um, at the restaurant. And I said, well, I'm waiting tables to, to, to be in ministry. And at, on the spot, he says, you're going to intern for us. We'll pay for your seminary. What? At the restaurant. Little did I know, my future wife was sitting right next to him. She was only 17. I didn't have eyes for her then, okay? But God provided that. And I, I first started interning for the church on a volunteer basis. They didn't have any money. So he said, I need you to volunteer intern. So I kept waiting tables. Volunteer intern for us until we can pay you. And I remember he said, okay. I need you to pray. We're having a whole church meeting. They were voting on the budget at the church that we had up there. And they said, we're voting to start paying you $250 a month. This is a big deal. $250 a month was a big deal for the church. I'm like, okay. So they pray, they pass it. And now I'm starting, I, I have a salary. I'm salaried at $250 a month. Okay. I, it was a big deal to me. And someone in the church had a little in-law unit in their house and they let me live there for free. Amazing. Okay. Now I had a little 2000 Honda Civic, two-door, okay? I fit into a two-door Honda Civic, believe it or not. If the chair was at factory setting, my head came out the sunroof. So I was one of those guys that was legitimately driving like this 
because I had to, not because I wanted to, because I had to, to fit into this car, all right? And uh, I needed new brakes, I needed new tires, I needed oil change, I needed everything. It was going to be like $1,800, $2,000. And I'm like, okay, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay to take care of my car just so I can get back and forth to church and, and do the things I'm doing with students. Like, and I remember praying this. I said, God, I just need you to meet my needs according to glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Help me get some tires and some brakes and, and let me figure this out. Now, I am a huge sports fan. Like I said, I'm from the Bay Area, so all of you Charger fans, forgive me. I am a big Raiders fan, okay? And yes, Raiders fans need Jesus, so they need a pastor on their side. I'm a big Golden State Warriors fan because they're up there as well. I like the San Jose Sharks, but my team and my sport is baseball. Love baseball, and I love the Oakland A's. And so I took a kid... One of my kids in my high school ministry, he's a freshman, who's now a pastor in Seattle. It's pretty cool. Um, for discipleship, we went to an A's game. We were given free tickets for the bleachers. Now, I don't know about, I don't know how Angel Stadium works or, or Padres or Dodgers down here. The bleachers in Oakland Coliseum, which is the nicest stadium in all of Major League Sports. <laughs> yeah. If you've ever been there, you laugh because literally when it rains, like sewage drips from the second story, like, and there's like buckets out, like, it's not a good stadium, okay? It's not a good, but it's home, right? We can overlook those things when we call it home. Uh, so I, I take a kid to the A's game, and bleachers is first come, first serve. So as soon as you get there, you get the seats that are open in the bleachers. And so we get there right when the gate opens for batting practice, and we, we run, and we get front row seats in right field, okay? And we're there for batting practice. No home run balls get to us, whatever. Um, we put our bags in. We go get hot dogs and come back. And at the start of the first inning, I'm sitting next to this 13-year-old kid, and I'm not a small individual. Um, and so Major League Stadium seats are like, are like uh, airplane seats. I kind of spill over with my shoulders, right? And so I'm either, I'm either hugging you or I'm over the top of you or I'm like sitting sideways like this, you know, just so that I'm not in people's way, right? It's the curse of being so large. So I, in the first inning, there's two seats open to, next to me. So I, I literally, first seat, I stand up and I move over one seat. Now, Barry Zito was throwing a no-hitter in the game. It was July 15th. Never forget it. And these guys with badges on come down and they say, hey, sir, are you sitting in seat number 10? Yeah, I'm in seat 10. We need you to come with us. I'm thinking, wait a second. I didn't throw the hot dog at the right fielder. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't cursing him out. I, you know, come on now. I thought I was in trouble. I'm like, is there, is there something wrong? Am I in trouble? He's like, no, 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 you're not in trouble. Your seat has been picked for a drawing tonight. Okay, right? And I'm thinking like, like you know, what are my chances? You know, like dumb and dumber, like one in a million, you know? And I said, of the 66,000 seats that are in the stadium, your seat was picked to participate in the drawing for a car they were giving away at the game. I thought, okay, cool. They said, for, for a couple things we got to verify. Are you California? Resident, and you have a driver's license? Show it to him. Yep. It's okay. Do you have car insurance? Yep. Got it. Okay, you're qualified. And like I said, I was thinking like one out of 100. So, well, you have a one in three chance to win a car tonight. And I'm thinking, I probably sound like the biggest nerd. I said, I have a 33.3% chance to win a, a car tonight? Like, yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. They're giving away a, a 2006 GMC Crew Cab Sierra truck. Much bigger than my two-door Honda Civic. More my size vehicle. And I said, hey, I got a 13-year-old kid here. I'm not his parent, like, but I'm in charge of him. Can I bring him with me? They said, yes. Yeah. So they took us to these back hallways of the Oakland Coliseum. And uh, they had me fill out all this paperwork saying, I won't sue Major League Baseball. I won't sue the Oakland A's. I won't sue GMC. So I fill all this out. And then they bring the other two contestants into the room. And it's gentlemen's rules, right? So ladies, and then whoever's older, than the young guy last, right? So it was like a mid-40s gal, a late to early 60s guy, a little bit older, and then me at 22. And uh, I said, here's what we're going to do. They bring out two bags, little, those little zip-tie backpacks, right? You can't see in them. One bag has three ping-pong balls. The other bag has three wiffle balls. The ping-pong balls are all numbered, one, two, and three. The wiffle balls are colored red, white, and blue. So we're going to pick the ping pong balls, gentlemen's rules. Don't show the number that you get 
until everyone's picked. So the gal picks first, she picks, the guy picks, I pick, and we all show. I have the number three. The older guy picked number one, the gal picked number two, I have number three. And they say, this is the order that we're going to pick the colors. So I didn't get a choice. Whatever one's left is what I got. Same is true for the colored wiffle balls. Whatever color wiffle ball's left is what I get. So the guy picks out the white wiffle ball, the gal picks out the red wiffle ball, I'm left with the, the blue wiffle ball. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take you up to this like uh, stage type thing they have in between the upper decks, um, and they had the big truck on display, and we're going to put you on the big screen, we're going to interview you, and then there's going to be a race on the big board on the television with a red truck, a white truck, and a blue truck. And whatever color car wins the race, that person wins the truck tonight. Like, okay, <laughs> this is cool. My heart was like, it would go from here to like here and like back and forth. Because I'm just like, what is going on right now? This is the craziest thing. And this is back in the day with the Nokia, you know, the little Nokia cell phones with the black screen and the only game on it was Snake, right? And if you're really good, you could fill up the entire screen and get about an hour and 15 of battery life. And so they interview us and in front of the whole stadium, like we just tell, tell them who we are and where we're from and all that sort of stuff. But little did I know that it wasn't, it wasn't just broadcast in the, in the stadium. It was on the television broadcast of the game too. And so my little Nokia phone starts going crazy. Are you on TV right now? Are you going to win a truck? Da, da, da. My phone dies in like five minutes. And they interview us. I'm like, okay, it's, it's time for the race. And they say, now we're next half inning will be the race. Now, Barry Zito was throwing a no-hitter. He threw like eight pitches and got through the inning. Took like three minutes. It felt like 20 to 30 minutes for him to get through this half inning. And they said, okay, it's time for the race. And they start the race. And the red truck and the, and the blue truck and the white truck, we're all have a share of the lead, right? You know, um, everyone has to feel like they've been in first place, at least at some point during the race. And then what I think is the middle, the blue truck races into a lead. And immediately I go, that means I lost. Because whoever's in the lead, usually someone comes from behind and gets the dramatic win. But what I didn't realize was that was actually the end. Because the blue truck sped into the lead and the, the screen stopped and it flashed winner on the blue truck. And the camera goes on me and I remember seeing myself on the big screen. And I'm like, holy, what just happened right now? And the A's mascot's this giant elephant. And I'm like hugging the elephant and jumping up and down. And they said, make sure you thank the A's, make sure you thank Major League Baseball, make sure you thank GMC. So I'm like, uh, uh, I, I, I want to thank the A's. I don't want to thank generally, you know, General Motors. I want to thank uh, Major League Baseball. And, and I'm like, I'm forgetting something here. I want to thank God. And he goes, all right, that, Matt from Danville won the car, blah, blah, blah. You know. I won a brand new GMC Sierra 2006 at an Oakland A's game. Now, the point of it is not, Pastor Matt said, if I go to a baseball game, God's going to give me a truck. <laughs> Not the point. When I was in need, God provided. He could have just provided someone in the church to say, hey, Matt, I'm going to get you new tires and brakes. You're going to be good. That would have been a miracle. But God showed up this way. I've shared that story so many times with people. It's my first time sharing it on a Sunday morning here at Fusion since I've been here in the last year. My wife... Well, she's like, are you going to tell the truck story, truck story? She's like, I've heard it so many times. <laughs> How can I not share that story? <laughs> so, God will meet your needs. Not your greeds, but your needs. And I am so grateful for that truck. That truck has been with four separate churches down to Mexico mission trips. You know why? It's not my truck. It's God's truck. Reuben just, Reuben just took down uh, bookshelves that got donated from the Bible College to Casa Esperanza, the mission, the mission home that we have for, for battered women and their kids because they're opening a library. And he took my truck to Mexico, and I trusted that it'd come back. And that thing's got 215,000 miles on it. And I will pour everything I have into it to keep that thing running for the rest of my life. <laughs> I might not do that, but... <laughs> If it dies, I might just be like, Kelsey, it's now yard decoration. That truck is not going anywhere. <laughs> What's that old rusted GMC? I want it. <laughs> you see, God will meet our needs. 
God came through in my life to meet my need. And wherever you're at, God will meet your needs because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God who provides. And I have seen him show up in my life. And by faith, I know that he will show up in your life because he is a father who loves us. And as we get to know his names and his, and, and his qualities, his characteristics, it gets easier for us to trust him in our faith. And so we need to understand that God provided us salvation. God provides us our strength and he will provide our needs.